those of you who were here last week, you will know we began a, a, a two-week, just time out if you like, a two-week uh, separation time just to seek God, um, particularly in the area of worship, your personal worship life, our collective worship life, and how, how that's looking at the moment. I, I, you know, if, if we were to ask, eyes forward please, give me your attention. If we were to ask to sum up LFC, this church, in one word, right? Now, now, for me, you may have your word, but for me, that would be worship. I think, I mean, it's not just part of what we do. It's incredibly central. It's incredibly powerful. But don't we get over familiar? Don't we? You live with someone, you take them for granted. You come to a church like this with, with power at this level. And don't we get over familiar? I travel more than all of you. I'm in more churches than all of you. Been in many churches this week alone. Sitting under worship, which is great, but still not quite where I find myself here. Yep. Really. So truly, there is some anointing, there's something special and it, to be honest, it bothers me. I'm concerned. I, I, I feel disturbed even in my spirit that we are not where we should be. Be that collectively, be that as a team, the worship team itself, us in our private lives. And as I just alluded to last week, I would like us to become a, a worshiping community. And that whatever happens here on Sunday is simply an overflow of whatever we have participated in in our personal walk with God through the week. I, I, I thank God for LFC. I really do. I thank God for this church and the liberty. But one of my greatest concerns is these walls here. We cannot be limited ouch, by these walls, right? We cannot, be, we cannot see that. So last week, Pastor Ferlin prayed for you and, and, and ministered to you. So let me continue that same concept. I mean, look at this platform here. This is what, 15 meters wide? Six meters, not even that. 15 meters wide, five meters broad. See, for some of this worship team, that's the size of their world. That's as big as it gets and for some people, that's as big as it's ever going to get. And the only thing that some believe in or believe for is a good Sunday. Do you understand? There's a big world. There's a big world outside these walls. And the giftings are given not just for this small little contained space. The giftings are given for all mankind. And this is what I see when I travel. You know, some places I go, how many ordained ministers here? 17? Some places I go, when I turn up, they haven't seen anybody since I was last there six months ago. Hey! And here we are, happy with a good Sunday. Well, I'm not happy with having a good... I'm happy with having a good Sunday. <laughs> and I praise the Lord for a good Sunday, but I believe for more. Amen. And I want the, the team here to move through a, a transition period as we look to the future. We look to whatever it is God has out there. But I guarantee you, you will not hit that target unless you change. Okay? Nothing changes unless you change. Oh, but God spoke to me and he told me, it doesn't matter. Many people hear from God, but they don't fulfill it. They don't fulfill it. God can speak, does speak. Job says that, right? But it never happens. It doesn't come to pass because they themselves do not meet the criteria. Many are called, but few fulfill it. Many hear, but few actually get through to become what God wants them to be. And LFC is a very, I won't go into detail, I haven't got time, but LFC is a very unusual bunch of people. I won't say weird, I'm tempted to, but I won't. <laughs> So last week, we, we were looking at the whole concept of worship as a family, as, a, as an individual, as a church, and for this team. 
And today, if I can just start with 101, if you like, start with basics. I like, I think that's a good approach to take to anything and build up from there. I thought, well, how can you, how could, where should we start? I love doing foundations, you know. I hear people say I don't want to, I'd be delighted to go to a class on repentance. Uh Amen? Amen? Because it's interesting. You always find something you didn't know. You always see something you didn't see. So, As I was thinking, praying this week, where should we start as a church who who have a heart for worship? I don't doubt that. But let's start today anyway by asking ourselves these questions. Who do we worship? Why do we worship Him? What ways do we worship? And when should we worship? In one of my books, on the back cover, it's Planting Churches in the Last Days, I just give a little overview that if you read your Bible, you will see that the church is referred to as the church. All the way up until you get pretty much towards the book of Revelation and you get to the end times and then it's referred to as the bride. So something's happened. There's a change. And if you look back in history, churches historically, the dark ages or whatever, a lot of the praise and worship was about God but not personal. It was singing of his great deeds. Great is the Lord and mighty are his works. You know the type of thing. Singing about him, the church. But as we get nearer the the wedding feast, the marriage supper, the lamb, it's becoming more personal. And now today, without hesitation, you find yourself singing to, not about, to him. Ministering unto God. And this is, almost like an engagement period. And it's important that we're, you know, mindful of the day and the time in which we live and enter in fully to the occasion we have here. What a time to live. What a time to be alive. What a blessing. Amen? Amen. To experience this, which is a personal relationship. The bridegroom is ready and he's calling us as his church to throw off the cloak of the denominationalism, the church, and to become that living bride, which is a worshiping body. Wow. Fantastic. And I hope that we can grasp that, enter into that, become that. Become a living example of what that is. Who do we worship? Question number one. I would consider myself a very reluctant convert. I did not want to get saved. I was quite happy in the world. Thank you very much. (laughs) I'm staying here. And I've got these guys telling me you need to go to church and get down on your knees. You must be joking. And but I had a very forceful, I obviously needed it. I had a very forceful evangelist who came to me, told me I was going to hell. I thought that's not a good deal for me. So I took some time out in my own mind, in my own life, and I began to seek after God. And I said, God, if if there is a God, who you know, who is the who? Who is this who that they're talking about? So literally, as a person who was completely lost, I went on a philosophical journey, not a religious one, just trying to find, is there a God? And I know there's some people here this morning who don't know God. And that's okay. You may, like me, have intellectual arguments, which I did have. I just couldn't see how there could be a God. Who? What God? So I just began, for the first time in my life, to seriously sit down and consider, could there possibly be a God? <laughs> could there possibly be one, a real one? Because if there is, and if there is a heaven and a hell, I know which one of those two I'm going to, because I haven't got a clue who this guy is. And I just began from, you know, an academic perspective, thinking about, for example, infinity. For spa- see the space between my fingers. For that space to exist, there has to be space for that space to be in. And for that space to exist, there has to be space for that space. And for that space to, ah, I see, infinity. That's scary. And then you've got eternity. For a second to exist, there has to be a minute. For a minute to exist, there has to be an hour. Then there has to be a year. So I mean, just logically, God's given you a brain so you can logically sit there and think, okay, I can accept that. Space, whoa, how does that work? Is infinite. God. 
It's beyond our ken, as they say in Glasgow. Beyond our ability to grasp it, but we know it's true. At the same time, we know that there's an eternity. Now, every created thing is in a situation of degradation. Everything that is created is actually going from bad to worse. The whole universe is falling apart, called atrophy. Therefore, we know that there was a creation point. There was a beginning point. There was a point when everything was new. But now it's degradating. And that brings us back to our creation, right? There must have been a moment, there must have been a time when things began. And then you think, well, what was before created things? And that's where you start to stumble into God. And that's where the revelation of Jesus Christ really, I don't care who you look at, all the false gods out there. There has been no religion, no cult, no faith on this planet that comes even close to Jesus Christ. There is nothing, nothing that has anything to compare with who he is, how he revealed himself, and still does today. Phenomenal. So as a lost person, not wanting salvation, I began to think about who this God could be, and you know, philosophically be- began to realize that my objections led me to a conclusion that if there was ever a time when there was nothing at all, nothing, then what would there be now? Nothing. Nothing can only come from nothing. So therefore, we know that created things have had a genesis, have had a beginning. So go back before that, and some scientists, this is just blows my mind, some scientists will say, well, there was a time when there was nothing. You're an idiot. <laughs> That's a stupid statement to make. It's a stupid, 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 stupid statement to make. Maybe you want to believe that. I refuse to accept that statement. There was a time when there was nothing physical. Okay, no problem. But God revealed to us that he was there. That he was the I am. The one, the self-existent one. The one that always was and always will be. Separate from time. And in that sense, from creation. He entered creation. But at this eternal God. So, coming to my conclusions, when I realized there's infinity, I realized there's eternity, I realized that there must have been a creator, then I've got to figure out which one of these pretenders, right, these individuals in world history that have said that they are God, which one is the real one? Could the real Jesus please stand up? You know what I mean? And as you look, there's no, it's, it's a no contest. It's a non-contest. As you look at Jesus Christ and you see what he did, I realized, this is, this is the road. And I'm going to investigate this road. So I got a Bible and I began to read scripture, began to look into who this God could be. And I saw that he said that I needed to repent of my sin. Some of you are lost here this morning. You don't need to stay that way. So I began to do in a very serious manner. I began to repent of every single sin I could think of in my mind. Everything in my life. I drastically, completely changed my life. Yeah. Everybody was amazed. And I'm still not saved. I was just repenting. Remember? Repent, believe, be baptized, receive. I, I was still not saved. I was just going through the whole process of coming to the Lord. And it took things. There were things I had to do. I had to change certain things. And I did. And then, you know, my my friend Richard was was telling me that if you seek God, you'll find him. That's what he says. If you seek him, you'll find him. God is powerful. And if you seek him, you'll find him. And I remember him saying that. And I remember thinking to myself, I am going to seek him. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to seek him. So he says, if I seek him, I'll find him. I'm going to seek him. So I started going to a local Catholic church, which was all I knew. Close to me. It used to open at 7.15. I was standing outside the door. Yeah. Night after night, I'm waiting for the, open the door. Let me in. So I would go in and sit in an empty church. And really, it's a question of, I don't know who. I don't know you. I don't know this God. Who? Worship? Nowhere near worship. I don't even know who he is. But I'm scared. 
I'm scared because of what I see. I'm scared because of what I begin to understand. So I've repented, but we're still not quite there yet. And recently I was up in Strathclyde University teaching there in, uh, to a new batch of students that had arrived in the UK. And I got a lamp, a light bulb on a lead, and I had a living light bulb that was alive, that was lit up. And I held the light bulb and I said, imagine you say to me that you don't believe in electric, right? And you say, I don't believe in electric, I don't believe in electric. So I took the bulb out and I said, stick your finger in there. You'll soon believe in electric, my friend. Yeah, you're going to get one shock. And that's how I perceived God. I thought, if he's there, and if I start to seek, boof, right? If he's there... And if this whole story is true, I am going to genuinely seek. Guess what happened when I sought? Born again. That's right. Took me two and a half weeks actually going to that church each night, continuously repenting, continuously changing things, you know, reconstructing my life and ended up being gloriously born again on a Thursday evening. Praise the Lord. And any of you who are not saved, I, I, I would say the same thing to you. You, maybe you don't want to do it here in a public place. Fine. But go home. Take the advice of Jesus. Go home. Close the door. And in secret, your father sees in secret, reach out for God and watch you'll get power. You will. Now you must be sincere. You must be sincere. And you must seek him until you find him. Not turning back. And Jesus has given a promise there. Anyone who seeks me will find me. If you want it, you can have it. The trouble is you don't want it, right? The world doesn't want it. So who do we worship? We worship Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Scripture. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That's who I worship. That's who found me. That's who I found, whatever you want to say. It's the true God. It's the only God. That's who we worship. Don't lose your awe of Him. Amen? Don't lose your awe of Him. Why do we worship him? Because it's dangerous not to. You worship something. Every person on this planet worships something. Every day of their lives. In fact, scripture gives you many things. This is not an exhaustive list. In the book of Revelation, it says when Jesus returns, people will refuse to stop worshiping demons. What's that all about? But people worship created things. Their houses. Their cars, money, things. God, how pathetic is that? What a cheapskate. What a, what a, what a, how, talk about being ripped off. Things. What are things? I call it the tyranny of things. Because I lost all things. And I know what things are. You need to put those things in their place. They are robbers. Things are robbers. Don't have it. What do people worship? You tell about what they talk about. You sit with some people, all they want to talk about is money. Right? They want to talk about things. I want to talk about Jesus, huh? Talk about Jesus. It's kind of scary. You can learn a lot from people listening to what they talk about. People worship statues, you know, different parts of the world, worship the moon. Or the biggie, really, is they end up worshiping people. Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, right? Paul goes into this. They have turned aside from the living God, giving up their bodies for, for male with male, female with female, right? And, and, and they have entered into relationships and people become something that other people worship. When some person is greater than God in your life, you're worshiping, my friend. You are worshiping. Oh, yes, you are. That's the word for it. They have become an idol. They have taken the place of God in your heart. Yeah. Don't worship people. Don't worship demons, heavens above. But for me, knowing you as I do, I think one of the biggest obstacles we face as a church, or you may face, is is your whole concept of God, your perception of Him, what He is like. And it's scary for me because I, as I sit with people maybe in counseling and I talk with them, when people start to tell you 
how they see God, I sit sometimes and I'm flabbergasted. I'm thinking, wow, well, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Man, you are completely wrong. No wonder you can't worship. Because I, the God that you just described to me, I couldn't worship that God. It doesn't make any sense. Where did you get that stuff from? Religion? What? Legalism? What? Where did you get it? But it's not God. It's not the real God. It's not the God of the Bible. And so I repeat, for me, I think some of you are stuck on your theology. You're stuck on your perception of who he is. And we need to clear that up. We need to get that right. We need to get back to, you know, basics, scripture 101 again. Who is this God and how do I find him? Now, you guys know me well enough by now. I'm a Bible guy, correct? Could have been a bit louder than that. I'm a Bible guy. I am 100% will not shift me from that. I need to remind you of that because I'm about to say something. I am absolutely a Bible guy. However, a slight problem because modern ch- some modern churches become Bible focused. Oh, it's a good word today. Got a good word today. And they're happy with that. Well, you may be happy with that. How's he? And if you follow Israel, they didn't so much revolve around the word, the, the word. They revolved around the presence of God. That's what the tabernacle was. And that's the purpose of this team here, by the way. To bring us to that place. To bring you to that place. To live in that place. And I fear that if I, I, I am a word-centered person. It's, 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 it's been the, the bedrock of my life. But I don't worship scripture. Hello. We do not worship scripture. And if I find myself deviating from that, I need to be as Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth, amen, but walking in that spirit, maintaining that spirit and not being academically stimulated by a word, if you know what I mean. Because many cultures are, they really are, and that drives me nuts. So by all means, the scripture will always remain at the center of my life. But where's the presence of God? Where is the presence of God? And if I can just carry on, in my relationship with God, knowing that his presence is not there, I've become religious. Right? If, 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 if he's absent, and I don't even care, how does that make him feel? Oh, Jesus be the center of my life. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, live in me. God, live in me. Let me know you. Let me not take you for granted. Now, I'm going to say a couple of things that may shock you, but you need to let me finish, okay? Agreed? These are my opinions. This is my perception of God. This is how I see God. You don't have to agree with me. All I ask you to do is to consider what I'm saying. Bombshell number one. I, I, I do not see God as a judge. I don't know about you, but I would find it very hard to worship a judge. (laughs) Bit scary judges, eh? Sitting in their big dock and their wings and all that stuff. Bit scary, the hammer. Worship? I don't know about that. That's a bit scary for me. And I don't know if it's accurate either. As you look at God in Scripture, you look at all the different descriptions of him... There are things that we know God has and things that God is. God has judgment. No question. I'm just saying I wouldn't want to make that his soul descriptive. Or I'm not going to worship. I hope you're listening to me. Some of you have a blockage in worship. Because when you close your eyes, you see a judge. You see a hard taskmaster. And you can't get past that. You need to understand, right, the difference between what God has and what God is. What describes him and what he does. So is he a judge? Yes, he's a judge. But I'm not going to describe him that way. I'm not going to perceive him that way. He has mercy. He is omnipotent, etc., etc. But scripture is crystal clear on this point. There's no negotiation. God is. God is love. 
and the perception, the image in my mind that has to overrule and override every other image is that. That this is a God who loves me. That's what he wants me to see. He wants me to get that point, right? And I fear for, I fear for Christians. When I left school, I left, as you know, with no qualifications. Hallelujah. So I became a painter and decorator. <laughs> ah, yeah, six months Paint that wall, paint this, yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything's magnolia, by the way. So you paint, 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 paint. Now, I used to wear white overalls. So if you saw me out in Camden with white overalls on, painting a wall, I would hope that you would think that's a bit odd. Right? Or if someone said to you, do you know, do you know Mike? And you said yes, well, describe him to me. He's a painter. I hope you wouldn't say that. Would you? No, I'm not a painter. Now, I did do painting. I did it, but I did it for a short time. But it doesn't define me. It would be gross error to let it define me. And I'm not, you see, people criticize me for this perspective. I had one guy, oh, he's dead now, but he chased me for years on this point. And in the end, before he died, he changed his mind. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Um, What this guy used to say to me, I said, I know God has judgment, but I refuse to see him. That's not going to be my image. I'm going to see him as love. And I'm going to accept that he, in some ways, according to Ezekiel, reluctantly judges, right? Take a look at this. That guy used to say to me, you're refusing to recognize the wrath and the anger and all that of God. That's your problem. And I used to say to him, no, you, my friend, are stuck in a little moment of time. That's your problem. You need to get a grip on the eternal God. That's your problem. You're stuck with life and sin, and you can't worship a God like that. Look, in eternity past, what relevance is judgment? It's of no interest. So we've got a loving God going back in history. But then we had the advent of Adam and mankind, so of course we have time and judgment, and then judgment is going to finish one day. It says that. I'll come to it in a moment. And then we enter into eternity when judgment is past. Do you understand? So to get this as my main concept of God, I've just killed my worship. And maybe I don't even know why. And throughout Scripture, God tries to deal with this multiple, multiple times to get us to see Him as He is. Unfortunately, the projector is down, but could you put the Scriptures up, Ray? The first Scriptures. There's multiple times in Scripture when God leads us through I need you to see this. The first one is in John chapter... Ray, could you get in the driving seat there, please? Thank you. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 5, verse 22. Listen to this. For the Father judges no one. See that? Now, ask me, answer me this question. Did you see the Father as a judge? Probably yes. Probably yes. But look at this. For the Father judges no one. No one. God's trying to tell you something. John chapter 12, verse 48. Whoever rejects me and refuses to accept my teachings has one who judges him, the very word that I spoke. Have your Bible. Thank you. Praise the Lord. You remember a few weeks ago, I wanted you to see the difference between what Jesus is saying here. It's like a judge who's getting into the dock. He's, he obeys the law, right? He lives by the law. The judge may be a very kind person. And the judge will stand there and say, you know, man, woman, this book, the law of this land will judge you. Are you with me? So I want you to understand what Jesus is saying. It's not my heart, but the word will be upheld. It's not my heart to judge you. It's not the Father's heart to judge you. But judgment will happen. Amen. Amen. And that last one there, I think it's at the bottom of that slide, Ray. Did it go to Isaiah? Look at this. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim, and he will be angry in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring his act to pass. Look at that. His unusual, strange act. What's this? This is talking about judgment. And Isaiah is describing God on the day of judgment, and he says he's being, not outside of character, but it's a strange way for him to be. It's a strange, a foreign task 
for him to perform, but he will perform it. Are you following me? So for me, we're talking about worship. We want to advance ourselves in worship. We want to move into a deeper place. That is only going to happen when my perception of God is corrected, is perfected, is improved. Amen. Amen. And I do believe, even from my background, there are many things that have left me from a Catholic background with a wonky view of him that has to be changed. And I pray that God help us do that. Who do I worship? The one true God, that's who. Why do we worship? Because he first loved us. It's instinctive. He paid my debt. He paid the price for my sin. Half five this morning, I walked into a coffee shop and as it just walked in the door, I noticed this homeless guy. He looked, it was freezing. He looked cold. He looked destitute. And, you know, I just turned to him and I said, you know, do you want anything? Do you want to get anything? You want food? Do you want, you know, coffee? What? And he started following me in. He was insecure. And I got him to the counter and he said, I'll have a cup of tea. And he got a cup of tea. The restaurant was empty. And I went and sat in my usual place. He got his tea. And I just noticed him linger and linger. And then eventually he just came over and sidled up beside me. (laughs) Yeah. And it was like, thank you. Not for the coffee. It was, thank you that you know I exist. So I am a human being. So I'm actually here. Thank you. And I could sense the gratitude. huh? Just the gratitude of someone who's got nothing to have someone who recognized him. Listen, friends, you were nothing. <laughs> okay, let's get that clear. You were nothing. You had no friend. You had nothing. And Jesus took your debt. Jesus paid your bill. Whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for me. Now, if that doesn't bring worship out of you, God help you. It needs to. Amen? Amen. 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 We worship him because before we lifted a finger, before we did anything, God loved us and sent his son to die for us. Jesus endured that. God help us. Give us a fresh revelation of that, God. Who do we worship? The one true God. Why do we worship? Because he first loved us. With what do we worship? This is such a a controversial thing. And again, I hope, uh, I I don't intentionally be controversial, but in order to break new paradigms, I need to be. I need you to see certain things. I notice on Sunday that some of you lift your hands and some of you do not. Some people even fold their arms, right? It is very important. What way do we worship? Do we sing? Do we shout? Do we clap our hands? What do we do? We all, everybody here needs to get a grip on the fact that it is critical for you to enter into some physical actions in worship. Can you say amen? Amen. Physical actions in worship are not what they seem. This is my opinion. They are not what they seem. And some of you have been stuck in life and you don't know why. You have been praying and asking God and you pray and you pray and you pray and you don't get that answer. Because some things don't get answered without a physical action. Remember, they couldn't drive out the demon. And Jesus said, aha, this one only comes out with prayer and fasting. An action, an additional action. Remember Moses? When Moses was on the mountaintop, remember? It wasn't the prayer that broke. It wasn't the prayer that won the day. It was the physical action. Right? Right? It was the fact that his hands had to remain up. And in that worship place, we have to just, you know, silence our mind and realize that there is, there is dynamics taking place when I humble myself and I lift my hand. I believe that with all my heart. I believe, you know, there's many things. Now, some worship teams get this so wrong. It's embarrassing. You know, you, I'm sure you've been in some of those churches. You go in and all the adults are here. It's like a meeting like this. And the worship is like, okay, everybody do the actions. Our God is so big, so strong, and so... Ma- oh, for heaven's sake. No, 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 no. 
That's not it. That's not it. There are actions, and they are very, very serious actions. And if you don't grasp that or understand that, it's another aspect of your worship that you will never break through in. You're going to get stuck. Right? So I repeat, some of you are stuck in worship because of your perception of God. Some of you are stuck in worship because you still refuse. You still refuse to do certain actions at certain times. I don't normally share testimonies like this because it sounds so highfalutin, hyper-spiritual and everything else. But let me trust you with this and tell you something. Things happen in the spirit. You know that? So I got off a plane with Rick Seward. I landed into a city and I walked into a very large meeting. It was a church I used to pastor. It was a very big building and there was gazillions of people in there. I didn't know. He didn't know. We just walked into an event. So I walked into the event, and I didn't know who the speaker was, but man alive was my spirit bothered. Uh, You know, who's that comedian? Uh, Do I look bothered? (laughs) I was really bothered. I was totally bothered. So I went into this room at the front little prayer room. I built it many years earlier. I went into that little prayer room, and you know what I did? It's something wrong. There's something wrong in this building. There's something wrong in this church. Something's not right. It's packed, but there's something wrong. And I can, I can discern, I can feel it. So I went into that little room, and Jeanette was with me, and I said, shh, 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 shh. And I just lifted my hands before God. And I tell you, folks, God took me. And I found myself, I, I, I was aware that I was on a mountain. And I began to pray and intercede and pull down strongholds. It was amazing. And from my spirit, tongues, rivers of tongues flowed out. And I went into that meeting not knowing what was going on. And that prophetess walked out on the platform with all those people. (laughs) And she pointed me out. I was about where you are, Ferlin. And she said, that man there, stand up. You are a man of God. Surely the Spirit of God is on you. All this flattery. That's all it was. And Rick was about 20 seats away on the other side. I looked across at him and I said, no, 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 no. And he said, it's good. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. It is not good. It is not good. You need to know the difference between what's good and what's not good. It's not good. That woman's not good. So the next day I went to the senior pastor who had organized that event. And he had four subsequent events across Ireland large churches, big events, and everything else. And I got to his house, and I said, we're canceling the events. Oh, no, we're not. Yes, we are. We're canceling the event. You're canceling all the events. And it took a long time. But in the end, that pastor turned to me and said, I have never seen you so exercised over something. I can't believe that you're like this. And on that basis, I'm going to cancel the event. So it was all cancelled, and that prophetess got on a plane back to the States. Th- two or three weeks later, I get, I hear, I can't remember how I heard, the agent who organized her events, he's an absolute demon. Oh. I said, what? Him? I, I know things about him he doesn't know. I know he should be in prison. He's a, he's a wicked, wicked man. And suddenly everything made sense to me. We landed in on a plane. No one was discerning. Sleepy Christians. Oh, no one can discern anything. Ha, what's wrong with this place? So God flew me in just for that job. Do the, pull down that stronghold. My point is, I say all all that to say this. My hands were up. It was a battle. It was a spiritual battle. I still don't know what was going on. But I had to raise my arms. I had to break. And so do you. I repeat, some of you are stuck because of your perception of God. You only see him as hard or as judgmental. He is a judge. But that's not how I see him. I see him as a God of love. And that's critical. Okay? In terms of worship, that's our topic. Secondly, some of you are stuck 
because of your refusal or lack of understanding about how this whole thing works in terms of physical interaction. We believe in fasting, right? That's an action. Prayer is an action. Praise is a worship. Well, also in worship, there are many things that are actions. Clapping, dancing, singing, raising your hands. And you need to engage with these things, not religiously, but you need to engage with them. I don't know if you follow physics or any of the National Geographic programs, but they're very interesting. There's a thing called a wormhole. Have you heard of a wormhole? Yeah? No, not one of those. <laughs> I'll say this briefly because for me it's very helpful. Einstein was considered the greatest genius who ever lived because we live in a three-dimensional world, right? This pulpit is 3D. Length, breadth, height, width. Einstein perceived one day that there was a fourth dimension that was time, which was also physical, right? That's why he's famous. That's a, isn't that a great thought to have? First guy ever to think that. He said time itself is physical, and time can be stretched out. Now, this is important for raising your hands, in my opinion. So say this is the time of Jesus, and say this is you today. It's a long way. Many light years, maybe. The distance between heaven and earth. It's a long way. God to far off. But the wonderful thing about time being a fabric is you can bend it. And if I take 20,000 years ago, or I take heaven, what happens when I raise it? It's called a wormhole. I can actually, instead of traveling 10,000 million light years, which takes 10,000 years, in the bending of space and time, you get what's called a wormhole. Did you get that? You pass through from one place to another in a split second. And for me, this is what, when Jesus walked through the wall, remember? He was moving in dimensionality. He's not subject to a 3D world. And don't let your logic limit you. What good is this? Don't worry about it. The rock concerts know all about it. They do their satanic signs, don't they? Yeah. All over the world, they've got their hands up. Christians, rock concerts, come on guys. It's the same thing. It's still worship. We all worship. But what do we worship? Could I have the slide up there, Ray, please? The next one. I took could I, the, the, the very first picture. Very, very first picture was a rooftop. That's it. I took this picture on Monday night. This was a worship event in London on the embankment. Some friends of mine organized it and they said, would I come and pray? It was fantastic. It was freezing, but it was fantastic. What they did, we hired a rooftop in London on the Thames Embankment. About 50 of us went down last Monday night about 7 o'clock, and we worshipped and worshipped and worshipped and prayed. It was awesome. But I did notice that every hand was down. It was cold. They had their hands in their pockets. And, but I did notice that the hands were down. And at a certain point... We were breaking through in worship. And at a certain point, I took my hands, I raised my hands. Folks, do you know what? It was like an electric shock. It was just, whoa. I thought, goodness me, we have broken through on this roof. So this is what I did. I'll just tell you the truth. I'm going to try that again. So I did it again, and I got the same thing. I thought, God can see us. God is hearing us. It was exciting. But you can just see... Pastor Timothy's from Los Angeles there in the middle. He was leading that section. And I was going to go over to him and I said, I was going to go over to him and I said, you know what, Tim? You need to get the people to raise their hands. Because there's power here. But I didn't need to. As I had that thought, that's exactly what he did. And that's when I took that shot. They lifted their hands and interacted in the spirit realm. Amen. Amen. Some of you are stuck because of your perception of God being wonky or not seeing the eternal God. He doesn't want that. Get a holistic view of him. Some of you are stuck because of refusal to engage in worship or in prayer in ways that maybe you're not familiar with and you need to break that. And the last question was, when do we worship? I'll tell you when you worship, folks. Yes, we worship here from 11 to 11.40. But isn't that the minimal? Yeah. And doesn't worship take place every day with the choices that I make? 
with the decisions that I make? Isn't that my worship? When the people in your workplace are doing wrong and you do right, isn't that worship? When do we worship? We worship every day. We worship every day. With every choice, with every decision, God most certainly sees that as worship. I was in Glasgow for one night this week and it turned out to quite an experience. I couldn't get a hotel room. I ended up in a dreadful place actually, which I would never stay, but I had nowhere to go. And I was looking out over the city. I thought, I'm not staying here for the evening. I'll go to a meeting. I'll go out to one of the churches and I knew them all. So I rang up the first big church. Um, it was about 600 members. I know the pastor well. So I rang the reception and I said to them, this was Tuesday night. I said, what time does your meeting start? And the reception said, what? What time does the meeting start? I saw on the website, it said, it said like six or seven. I just wanted to know what, what building, what time? Oh, no, that's an old, that's an old page. We don't have any meetings. I was just looking to worship. No, 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 no. No, you'll have to come back between 11 and 11.40 on Sunday. I, said. I thought, okay, it's all right. So there's another big church, actually about 20-minute walk from my hotel. So I went over there. It was daytime. I went over, went into reception. Many hundreds of people in this church. I said, hiya, what time's the meeting tonight? Meeting? There is no meeting. Who said there was a meeting? I just thought maybe Christians might worship God. No? Okay. <laughs> so I rang the third. Same response. That's three major churches. Now I'm up to thousands of people. And no. Are you with me? And I went back to my hotel and I remember looking out over the city and I thought, I wonder how God sees this city tonight. Because that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. I would have thought that the Christians would have organized themselves. Thank God for Steve Upple. He's just organized two 48-hour sessions of prayer and worship. Two. I think it's Tuesday and Thursday. So two nights a week. There's 24 7, 48 hours of prayer going on. They've built a room upstairs. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? God deserves that, doesn't He? Not 40 minutes on Sunday. God deserves continual worship. And for that to happen, I don't want to pick on the worship team, but I'm going to pick on the worship team. Praise the Lord. Because this is your moment. This is your time to grow, and I don't want you to miss it. I just love the worship here. I think it's absolutely fantastic, but I repeat. In fact, I would even warn you, be very careful of growth and change, because God is not mocked by anyone. You use it or you lose it. And what we have here is very special. But I would counsel you, use it or lose it. Now, I, you guys would say to me, we're really gifted. Aren't they? Yeah. So am I. Okay? So am I. So I know you're gifted. It actually doesn't mean much, to be honest with you. It doesn't mean much. And it doesn't mean that you can achieve much. I repeat, is this the limit of our worship ministry? Is that the limit? The world's the limit. And I want the team, I want all of you, listen to me. Musicians, singers, leaders, listen to me. I could almost prophesy right now, you know. I've done many things in my life. And I thank God for it. As I look back over the years, phenomenal things have happened. And I, 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 I'm not going to prophesy. I say not the Lord. Let me safeguard myself. I say not the Lord to you team if you would just do a little bit more just a little bit more you do you pray do you pray pray more do you fast fast a little bit more do you seek god for a prophetic song sabrina seek him more just do more you're not doing enough that's my theory. <laughs> You're not doing enough. And let me not just the worship team, but everybody here, because there's some really 
you know, anointed people in this place. Are you listening to me today? Do more. Just a little bit more and you will be shocked at what God... I need an explanation why we're not impacting the world with our worship. I need an explanation. Because it doesn't make sense to me at all. I believe we can do that, don't you? Yes. Oh yes, we can. But you're going to have to do more. Jesus. Just a little more and you can see dramatic changes. You know I did TV for three years and produced eight books. And one guy, in fact more than one guy, several people over the years, pastors say, can I talk to you? And I sit down with them and they say, for years I've been meaning to do something. For years I believe God wanted me to do radio or write a book or go on TV. How come you did that so many times? How come you achieved that? And what I would say to those pastors, okay, what was your last series? And the guy would say, uh, I did healing. How many parts? Eight parts. Right, where is it? It's at home somewhere. But if you had taken the same series and just did a little bit more, oh yeah, just another few hours a week, another little bit of research, you watch the difference. Are you following me? Yes. So that's what I've done. I, 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 yes, I do probably do more work than other pastors. Maybe, maybe triple, quadruple, I don't know. A lot more. And I, I, let me explain. Many years ago, God spoke to me about what's love got to do with it. Remember? I worked hard on that. No one can see me. I did my research. I did all that. And I know we did a TV program and everything else. That went out in half the world. And it's fantastic. But just these guys here. I just finished a meeting with these guys. Impact Magazine. This magazine's published in 53 countries. So I just had a meeting with the deputy editor. And he said to me, would you give us the book, What's Love Got to Do With It? And we will serialize it throughout 2018 in 53 countries. Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, listen to me. Many of you have giftings. But you need to do more. Are you following me? Just a little bit more and you will see what God will do with that. Right? It is worth the effort. As I look back, you know, what was the difference in you and all the other guys we worked with? Just that tiny little bit extra. So believe in yourselves, folks. Believe in yourself. But you're going to have to do the work. It's not automatic. It's not automatic. What God is attempting to achieve in us is not automatic. You have your part to play, your sacrifices to make. Oh, Jesus. Let me drop another bombshell. Prepare yourself. Boom. I don't believe that God is seeking to be worshipped. Wow. I don't believe that God is seeking to be worshipped. Just let that sink in a minute. I mean, when I got saved and they said you had to worship God, you had to do all this and bow down, I thought, this, this God must be an egotistical maniac. Right? I, I couldn't figure it out. I thought, well, what's going on? What, why would someone want that? There's something not right there. Something's, I'm missing something. Something's wrong. Um, you know 1 Corinthians where it describes love, Right? Love is not self-seeking. It would be self-seeking, wouldn't it? And God is love. So something's not making sense. If God is love, and we get the description in 1 Corinthians that it's not self-focused, it's not self-seeking, it's always outward, then how does worship even exist? And if I don't get that part right, how can I worship? I'm still missing something. Some of you are stuck on different points and some of you are definitely stuck on this point. God doesn't so much seek worship because that's not in his nature. He's humble and meek. But what he does seek is worshipers. And there's a subtle difference in there. He seeks worshipers. Why? Well, sorry folks, but you are beaten, battered, bruised, sinful. You're a human being. And inside from his position this glorious God sees you 
in a beaten state, in a sad and sorry state. And you know the answer for you? Worship. And so when he calls you to worship, it's not a megalomaniac. It's not an egotistical God. It's a God who sees you that when you look at him, because that's what worship is, when you look at him, you'll be changed. And the heart of God in calling us to worship is returning unto you, healing you. Amen. Amen. I can worship a God like that. Amen. I can worship a God like that. He is not self-seeking. He understands me. He sees me. Could I have the last slides up, please, Ray? The scripture at the end. In fact, let me just do these. I'll read through those, those, the, the comic strips. You remember this. I love this. Because it's my perception of God, and it's the perception of God I want you to leave with today. When the world started, man and God were really good friends, and nothing got in the way of their relationship. Next. Now, uh, j- j- just go back one, Ray, please. See God's face? See God's face? He's a happy God. Next slide. But one day, man decided he couldn't care less. And without thinking, he threw something into the relationship. Now look at God's face. God wants his man back. That's you, folks. That's me. God wants his man back. Next slide. And before long, the friendship was broken because the rubbish was cluttered up and they weren't on speaking terms. Now look at God's face. God's sad and man is sad. Next slide. So God became man, cleared up the sin. Next slide. But they were so angry they killed him. They didn't understand what was happening. Last slide. And that's the face of God I want you to remember. A God who forgives. A God who doesn't hold bitterness. Who doesn't hold the grievances. But is actually a happy God. I think, I can't, was it Richard Roberts preached that famous sermon in the 1500s? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Have you heard of that? I want to do another one. Called Sinners in the Hands of a Happy God. You see that person there? That's you. That's you. An interaction with God we call worship. And through worship, you're healed. Through worship, your pain is removed. Scripture says this, when we look upon him, we become like him. We're transformed. I pray that God does that within you. Which of these, which of these represents God for you? Is he angry? Or is he happy? Your worship will directly be affected by the answer to that question. I struggled with this last night. Do you remember Victoria Columbia? Oh, I wanted, I couldn't show the picture. It's too upsetting. Some of you will remember that. There was a young girl. She was 10 years old in London. She was tortured by her parents. They killed her. And at one point, after the whole thing was over, the national newspapers took a picture of Victoria Columbia and they put it in all the press. I will never forget the day I saw that because the parents had poured boiling water on her face and her skin was gone. Um, It was just horrific. That's why I didn't show the picture. I found it, but I thought I can't show that. Just horrific. But the reason I mention it is this. That dear child... Social services put her against the wall with all the skin missing off her face. And they obviously said, look at the camera. And she just burst into a smile with all the skin gone. No judgment, no anger, no bitterness. It was a beautiful picture, but terribly sad. And when I saw that picture, this is what it reminds me of. It reminds me of God. This is not God. It's an unusual act. David gave a great example at the couple's weekend when the kids are misbehaving and he has to run up the stairs. But I 
guarantee you, if you ask them to describe him, that's not the description. My dad's a good dad. Are you with me? But judgment has to happen. But it's not a descriptive. This is not my God. This is my God. Sinner, you're a sinner. And you're in the hand. Unfortunately, he was also scarred. But still smiles. Doesn't hold the bitterness. Doesn't hold the anger. The anger that was in the heart of God was exhausted on Jesus Christ. Every last drop of it. And in the, some people only see God as angry. You're wrong. You are completely wrong. In the book of Isaiah, it says he, he, he poured out his anger on the Son, right? Poured it out on Jesus. So when he looks at you, he forgives you and just wants to restore you. Amen? Amen. Jesus. Hallelujah. I mentioned rock concerts earlier, right? You go to a rock concert and the band get up there and everybody's raised their hands, don't they? And you enjoy it. And you go home. But you never met the band. And on Sunday, we come here and we enjoy it. But do you meet the Lord? Do you ever go backstage and meet the Lord face to face? This one, the real God, the good God. One thing is for sure, he is worthy of worship. And whatever blockage is in my head, I need to get rid of it. We're going to do exactly that our time is is gone um we're going to end a little bit differently today i want the worship team to sing two songs for us but i don't want you to leave out of respect for god and in this little moment as we conclude today i want you to consider yourself backstage and consider yourself in a one-to-one with god And if anything in your mind, like in mine, has been a misconception of a hard God, ask God to take it away. And that you would see him as he is. See him as he really is. I have the worship team, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.